In this video, I'm going to solve this question. The following regression model was estimated using annual time series data for the period 1990 to 2012 for a certain country. And this is the estimated equation that's given to us where Y is demand for cheese, X2 is disposable income and X3 is price of cheese. Now, before I read the other information that's given to me in the question, let me first spend some time in clarifying a couple of things over here. First of all, you need to be very clear with what is a sample equation and what is the population equation. Basically, this equation that you see over here, this is estimated sample regression equation. So this is estimated sample regression equation because we are given log of yt hat. So this equation is giving you the fitted values of log of yt. So this is the estimated sample regression equation. How will the population equation look like? Well, the population equation will look something like this. So you will have log of yt equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 log of x2t plus beta 3 log of x3t plus u where u is the population error beta 1 beta 2 beta 3 are the population parameters okay now because beta 1 beta 2 beta 3 are the population parameters this b1 b2 and b3 are the estimators of these parameters so b1 is the estimator of beta 1 b2 is the estimator of beta 2 and b3 is the estimator of beta 3 okay so this is the first thing that you should be clear about that what are the sample equations and what are the population equations now the next thing that i want to discuss is annual time series data for this period for a certain country now let's say that this country is india this means that we have data on india on three variables and those three variables are log of yt log of x2t and log of x3t and we have this data for the period 1990 so for the period 1990 we will have some values over here for the period 1991 we will have some values over here for the period 1992 we will have some values over here and this will go on till 2012 and we will have some values over here and this is the essence of annual time series data basically understand what's happening over here so in this entire data we are working with a single entity and that single entity is india and we have data on multiple time periods over here the first observation is this and it has the data for the period 1990. The second observation is this and it has the data for the period 1991. This is the third observation. It has the data for the period 1992 and so on. This is the last observation. So in total, how many observations do we have? We have 23 observations in total. Okay. Note that to find the number of observations, do not do 2012 minus 1990 if you do this then you will get 22 but 22 is not the right answer because in the number of observations we have to include 1990 and 2012 both okay so if you are including both of these years then your number of observations are going to be 23 and not 22 be careful with this because if you calculate the number of observations wrong many things will end up getting wrong Okay, so this is how you can visualize your annual time series data. Basically, every observation is giving you the data corresponding to a particular time period. And the last thing that I want to discuss over here is the subscripts that we have in this equation. Note that when you work with time series data, then you put T as the subscripts. And when you work with cross-sectional data, then you put I as the subscript. Okay, now that we have understood the basics, let's take a look at the information that's given to us. So we are given the estimates of the coefficients. That means we are given the value of B1, B2 and B3 and we are also given their standard errors. So this over here is the value of B1. This over here is the value of B2 and this is the value of B3. This is standard error of B1. This is standard error of B2 and this is standard error of B3. So this is all about the information that's given to us in the question. Let's take a look at the part number one. In part number one, we have to interpret the partial slope coefficients. 
First of all, note that we are working with the multiple linear regression model because we have two independent variables on the right hand side. That is why they are using the word partial. And secondly, they are asking us for partial slope coefficients and the slope coefficients are B2 and B3. Note that B1 is not a slope coefficient, so we are not going to interpret that. We are only going to provide the interpretations for B2 and B3 and we are also given the values of B2 and B3. Basically, B2 is this and B3 is this. Now, in this functional form of the model, we have logs on both the side. We have logs on the dependent variable and we have logs on the independent variable. This type of functional form is called log log. So these type of models are called log log model because you have log on the left hand side of the model and you also have log on the right hand side of the model. This is not the only name that we have for this type of functional form. There are many other names as well, but I'm just going to call it a log log model. So in the log log model, the slope coefficients give you the elasticity. Well, let me write the complete interpretation over here. So we are given that B2 is equal to 0.45. So you can write that this 0.45 is showing you the elasticity of Y that is cheese demand with respect to X2 that is disposable income. And because we are working with the multiple linear regression model, we have to keep the other independent variables constant. That means we have to keep X3, which is cheese price constant. Or you can also write the interpretation in this manner. You can say that if X2 increases by 1%, then on an average, because the interpretations are always on an average basis, Y will increase by 0.45%, keeping X3 constant. This is important. Do not forget to write this. Okay, so this is the interpretation of B2. Similarly, you can interpret B3. Note that B3 is a negative number. It is minus 0.377. So it is showing the elasticity of Y with respect to X3 keeping X2 constant or in other words you can write that if X3 increases by 1% then on an average Y will decrease by 0.377% keeping X2 constant. Okay, in this case it's decreasing because we have a negative sign over here and in this case it was increasing because we have a positive 0.45. Okay, so this is how you have to interpret the partial slope coefficients. Let's move to the second part now. If the calculated F statistic for overall significance of the given model is this value, then what is the R square of the model? Basically, we have to find the R square of this model and we are given the value of the F statistics for the overall significance of the model. Now, first of all, what do we mean by overall significance? Overall significance means that we are testing whether this model is of any use or not. In other words, we have to test whether this variable has any impact on this variable and whether this variable has any impact on this variable. Because if both of these variables have no impact on log of yt, that means the entire model is useless because these are the only two variables that you have on the right hand side. Okay, so the null hypothesis is going to be whether beta 2 is equal to beta 3 is equal to 0. Now note one thing over here that do not write your null hypothesis as B2 equal to B3 equal to 0 because you can never hypothesize about the value of the estimators in the null hypothesis. Basically think of it in this manner that you already know the value of B2 and you already know the value of B3 then why are you going to hypothesize the value of B2 and B3 in the null hypothesis. Basically what we try to do in the hypothesis testing is that given these values we try to say something about the population parameters. So whenever you write the null and the alternative hypothesis make sure that you are writing the population parameters and not the estimators. So in this case your null is that beta 2 and beta 3 both of them are equal to 0 and your alternative hypothesis is going to be that at least one of these two is not equal to 0. So at least one of these two parameters is not equal to 0 is not equal to 0. Okay now what is the formula that we have to find the value of f calculated? Well the formula is r square ur where ur means unrestricted minus r square r where r means restricted divided by the number of restrictions that you have in the null hypothesis. So number of restrictions and this entire thing is divided by 1 minus r square ur divided by degrees of freedom in the unrestricted model. 
Okay, so this is the formula that we are going to work with. Let's understand the values that we are given and the values that we have to find. First of all, we are already given the value of if calculated, it is 492.513. So we know this value. Now, what are the number of restrictions that we have in the null hypothesis? Well, to count the number of restrictions in the null hypothesis, you have to count the number of equal to signs. So how many equal to signs do we have? We have two equal to signs. That means the number of restrictions is two. Note that to find the number of restrictions, do not count the number of parameters. Because if you start counting the number of parameters in the null hypothesis, then in some of the cases you will get the right answer, but in some of the cases you can get the wrong answer as well. Okay, so whenever you have to find the number of restrictions, count the number of equal to signs in the null hypothesis and not the number of parameters in the null hypothesis. Now, before we discuss about these values, let's first figure out what is the unrestricted model and what is the restricted model. Basically, in this case, this is your unrestricted model. Okay, so this model is your unrestricted model. And if you impose these two restrictions on this unrestricted model, then the model that you're going to get in return is what we will call the restricted model. So if I impose the restrictions, then I will get beta 1 plus 0 multiplied with log of x2 t plus 0 multiplied with log of x3 t plus u t. This implies that we get the model as log of phi t equal to beta 1 plus u t. So this is the model that we are going to call the restricted model. Okay, so this is the restricted model and the above model that is this model over here. This is your unrestricted model. Now what is r square u r? Well, we don't know what is r square u r because that's the thing that we have to find. We have to find the r square of the model that's given to us. So in the presentation that I am giving you, this boils down to finding the value of r square u r. So that's what we have to find. So I don't know this value and I don't know this value. Now, what is the r square of the restricted model? Well, as you can see, the restricted model does not have any independent variable on the right hand side. And if there is no independent variable on the right hand side, then we cannot explain any variation in the dependent variable, right? That means the r square of the restricted model is going to be zero. So this value over here is zero. Now we have to figure out the degrees of freedom in the unrestricted model, which is this model. Now we know that the degrees of freedom, DOF is the short form. So the degrees of freedom in any model is equal to the sample size minus the total number of parameters that you have in that model. And when I say total number of parameters, I mean you have to count the intercept as well. Okay, now in this case, we have to find the degrees of freedom in the unrestricted model. So what's the sample size? Well, I have already discussed this with you that in this case, the sample size is 23. And what are the total number of parameters that we have in the unrestricted model? Well, we have three parameters, beta 1, beta 2 and beta 3. So this will become 23 minus 3. That means the degrees of freedom in the unrestricted model is equal to 20. Okay, so this number over here is 20. And now we have figured out all the information. All we have to do is that we have to utilize this information to find the value of r square u r. So let's do that. So now we can write that 492.513 is equal to r square u r minus 0 divided by 2. This whole thing is divided by 1 minus r square u r divided by 20. So this implies that we get 492.513 multiplied with 1 minus r square u r divided by 20 is equal to r square u r divided by 2. Well, if I start cancelling, then I can write 10 over here. So this implies that 492.513 multiplied with 1 minus r square u r is equal to 10 r square u r. And this implies 492.513 minus 492.513 r square u r is equal to 10 r square u r. You can take this to the right hand side. So this will become 492.513 equal to 492.513 plus 10 multiplied with r square u r. This implies that r square u r is equal to 492.513 divided by 
502.513 and this implies that r square ur is equal to 0 0.9801 and this is what we wanted to find so the final answer is that the r square of the given model is 0 0.9801 okay and that's it for this question